Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. We're doing UC Maximus Grand Rounds. This is the first of our Urgent, grand, urgent Care Grand Rounds series. And uh, we're excited to do it tonight. We've got Scott Coburn, we've got Gita Pencil, we've got Brit Guest, Mike Weinstock and myself, Mel Herbert. And I'll tell you more about UC Maximus as we go. But let's get into the schedule. We're gonna talk about monkeypox up front. Then we're gonna do some images. We're gonna rip off a toenail. We're gonna talk about steroids and pharyngitis. We're gonna do a great little case and uh, then we'll do some summary and more. But let us talk about the big thing that's in the news right now, which is monkeypox. So what do you do wherever you are if you see one of these cases? Well, call public health is probably the most important thing right now because the guidance here is changing all the time. But if you want to make the diagnosis, you can actually take a swab and you can swab an open lesion and get some of that virus, put it into a viral transport medium and send it off for PCR. You can send that PCR for herpes and chickenpox as well because that would be part of the differential. Scott, you were telling me that you can actually just swab unruptured ones as well. Is that right? Yeah, right now the California Department of Public Health, at least in Los Angeles, is actually recommending you don't need to go ahead and unroof the lesions. You can just vigorously swab up to three lesions that appear morphotypically the same, even if they're not completely open, to submit your swabs, which makes it a little bit better, I think. Now, uh, why is this important? Because actually you can vaccinate high-risk patients, and we've got two vaccines. One of them is a smallpox vaccine, and one is a more monkeypox specific vaccine. And if you can get that vaccine into people within the first four days, you can attenuate or even obliterate the disease before it begins. If you get in between about day 14, day four and 14, you can have a reduced disease. Exactly how good these vaccines are, we aren't exactly sure because we're in a bit of a data-free environment. Because let's think about the history here. Monkeypox was first described in 1958 in monkeys, although it's probably not a disease of monkeys. It was probably given to monkeys by a secondary host, maybe uh, mites or something, we're not even sure. The first human case was in 1970. There hasn't really been outbreaks outside of Africa since the 1970s, and there, there was just a few cases. There were some international cases, but they were directly related to those people sort of coming to other countries. So now the WHO says this is a worldwide public health emergency with 70,000 cases throughout the world as of about now. Here are some of the things that you might see. So you'll see some lesions here. This could be chickenpox, this could be monkeypox. Hopefully it's not smallpox because there hasn't been a case of that in 30 or 40 years. Different stages of the lesions here, you can see some crusting, so maybe these are starting to get better, but there can be different stages of these lesions. Mostly the virus is being spread from those lesions and from direct contact with those lesions, some palms and soles stuff, so you've got to think about differential diagnoses there, things like syphilis as well. So here's a New England Journal article from last week, and let me quickly summarize this. So this, this was from April 27th to June 24th, and this was a consortium of uh, hospitals across the world. So 95% of the cases in this series were sexual transmission. 95% um, of these people had rashes. 64% uh, had less than 10 lesions. 73% of those were anorectal. 41% were mucosal fever and about 62% lethargy. And 40%, about 30% of people had myalgia headaches. So just sort of a viral syndrome-like thing. There were about 13% of these patients uh, that got admitted. And this was usually because they couldn't drink because they had a lot of oropharyngeal lesions because they said ha had some other disease. And usually uh, the incubation period was between seven days and about three weeks for this disease. There had been no deaths in this series, but since then there's actually been a death in Brazil, Spain, and maybe one in the US yesterday. So although the mortality is very low, it is not zero. In Africa, in the prior episodes, it looked like the mortality was about 10%. But this is probably a different strain, and I say that because look how quickly it has spread across the world, unlike the prior episodes. So we're probably looking at a different strain, and so this feels very much like two years ago with a brand new virus that we are just starting to learn about. So we can talk more about monkeypox a little bit later, but let us now go to Scott and talk about some images of the evening. We're going to keep this moving real fast tonight. Thanks so much, Marlon. Speaking of images, we want to give a huge shout out to the JPS Emergency Department for those great images of monkeypox that we can share with you tonight. But let us jump into the clinical images we're going to teach you about from the fast track area, the urgent care area that we've seen. It's going to be really fun. So the first case, you have somebody who comes into your urgent care, is complaining they're having some difficulty walking, and when you go and examine them in the bed, you ask them to bring their toes to their nose, and this is what you see having some real difficulty here doing that on the right hand side. So Gita, what do you think is going on here and what are some of your next steps? 
All right, well, Scott, I think what this video shows is that the right foot is having trouble dorsiflexing. Uh, look, looks like the left can do it fine. The right is having limited dorsiflexion, so this would be what we would think of as a foot drop. Uh, so in terms of what I would do next, um, I think as we do in a lot of things, I would do a, a good history and physical next because whatever I'm thinking is the cause of the foot drop is going to actually determine what comes next. So I think the first thing that's really common that causes the foot drop is some kind of compression. Um, most often it's the perineal nerve uh, wrapping around the fibular head and compression somewhere around that level. The last time um, it was a patient who uh, was a carpenter and was on their knees for like hours and hours and hours and hours. And then when they stood up, they had a foot drop. And so the nurse came in and asked, like, is this a code stroke? And I was like, no, this sounds like a, a peripheral nerve problem. So, um, but that kind of long-term compression can cause a nerve palsy. So that's one thing that you could think of. You could get that from your history. Um, compartment syndrome is something else that can do it. So hopefully you would have other things cluing you into compartment syndrome. Uh, neuropathies can do this. So if it's a diabetic with advanced neuropathy, um, alcoholics, sometimes they'll get bilateral foot drops. Hopefully that's something that you would kind of start gleaning from your history and physical um, history of trauma, like actual trauma, orthopedic trauma, um, can involve the perineal nerve. You can you can see it in like really bad ankle injuries, but where you where you most often see it, I think, is in knee injuries. Um, for the same reason as the perineal nerve comes around uh, that fibular head and it's also sort of tethered by um, the tendon at that area, don't forget the arteries there, um, which would actually, one thing I would definitely want to mention is that um, if it's associated with a knee injury, you really want to think about knee dislocation uh, because a lot of knee dislocations self-reduce before they come in. So if they had a transient knee dislocation and they have knee pain, uh, you might not know they dislocated, but evidence might be that their perineal nerve is injured. So if they've got foot symptoms and knee pain, then you have to think, could this patient have trans transiently dislocated? Should I be looking for arterial damage, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so I would basically, I want to think about all those causes that I can think of for a foot drop, and then that's going to guide what am I going to do next. Thanks, Gita. That's a great summary. So this is foot drop. It's on the exam. However, the other things to think about are the causes that Gita mentioned, you know, they almost kind of, as we ascend up, they become less and less common as um, uh, etiology for the reason the patient's having their foot drop. So the perineal nerve injury, the most common. Moving up, you can see this with sciatic nerve problems, compression, especially lateral herniations of a lumbar disc. Spinal cord compression, it's pretty rare to get unilateral weakness from this, and for strokes, even rarer to have isolated foot drop, but it is still in the realm of possibility. So you need to identify whether one of these larger, higher up processes going on in your urgent care, because a lot of these things here are gonna need to be transferred to a higher level of care to get a more uh, thorough workup, some neuroaxial imaging. Britt, is there anything on physical exam that you really look for for these guys? Um, I like to have them stand on their toes to really see the degree of weakness. I like to do a good sensory exam. And I think the one other time outside of what Gita was talking about with comp uh, compartment syndrome, all that stuff, sometimes when people have been wearing casts for a long period of time, they go up towards just below the knee. You can also see it then. That's, that's a couple instances that I've seen foot drop. But I like to have them stand on their toes and do a good sensory um, uh, exam. That's a great point. The post-cast foot drop, something I've seen a lot too. It's pretty common. So let's move on to our next image. So we have someone who's working at a construction site. They were mixing up some cement, had some lye in it. Some of this liquid cement splashed up into their eye. You put some fluorescein drops on them, put it under a blue light. This is what we see, Mike. What do you think is going on in this image here? Yeah, so what we see here is a classic alkali injury, which of course is the more serious and concerning type of injury that we have in the eye. And it looks like a pretty extensive amount of space that is covering over the cornea there. You can see a lot of fluorescein uptake. The nice thing is I don't see any, what's called the Seidel sign, as far as any fluorescein dripping down, which would indicate a uh, puncture of the actual full thickness puncture of the cornea. So in these types of situations, certainly we wanna make sure that we get that irrigated especially quickly. And in fact, if the patient can has even started that irrigation in the field, that's the best way to go. It's hard to really get good irrigation unless you're able to really anesthetize the eye. So getting a couple drops of propracaine or alkane in the eye are important to do first. 
And I'm not a big fan of like creep, right? Like it's a regulation, let's just go a little bit further to make sure. But in this situation, I am a fan of that in the sense that we just want to irrigate as much as we think we should irrigate and then keep irrigating and then do more because these are bad injuries and any amount of alkali and that liquefactive necrosis that we can prevent the better. Absolutely. Severe chemical burn, huge defect in the cornea that's taking up all that fluorescein here. It's almost like a perfect line where that splash occurred, which is uh, pretty interesting to us. So with chemical burns, they're also kind of like corneal abrasions as well with the kind of fluorescein uptake pattern that you'll see. Obviously, this one's a lot more intense than your typical abrasion, but washing out the eye and irrigating it's so important. And you know, in the emergency department, a lot of times we use these lenses that can be the Morgan lens, which you first obviously numb the patient's eye up with some drops like we talked about and put liters through in order to get that fluid out of there. Not every urgent care, not every emergency part might have access to this. A really great trick of the trade is taking a nasal cannula and just ask the intern to place it on the patient. They put it up here thinking that that's the way to do it. Um, but you actually just allow gravity to irrigate saline through the nasal cannula, fill up the tear ducts and have it all wash out over time. Just as effective and you probably have a nasal cannula exactly where you are for giving oxygen, not necessarily giving saline. All right, so the last image that we have for you guys tonight. You guys ready? Ready. All right. Ready. So we're moving in. Mel, I don't know if this is monkeypox or not. We got this lady who comes here with this rash. She says it's been really painful in this area over the past few days. She's having some changes in her hearing. You can see it's really kind of centered on the left side of her face. And the image here extends into the left side of her mouth. And she also has it kind of going in the ear a bit. You know, Britt, what do we think is going on here? All right, so this looks like shingles, but it looks like a special kind of shingles. And the way that I remember is like something looks like it's rammed into the ear. So this looks like a Ramsey Hunt presentation of shingles. Very concerning, not a good thing, very uncomfortable. Exactly right. So this is a shingles is a zoster infection of the lower distributions of the maxillary nerve. So the thing you really have to watch out for is if it's involving the eye at all. So zoster ophthalmicus, and you try saying that 20 times fast. Um, here the Hutchinson sign where you have a lesion on the nose is sometimes a dead giveaway. It won't always be there. So you can see a little bit of yellowing around the eyes of this patient where we did a fluorescein exam just to make sure there was any ocular involvement, given the extensive involvement to the rest of the lower distributions of the maxillary nerve. Um, Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is the name of the game. Very painful. Make sure to get patients some neuropathic pain control on board in addition to giving all your antivirals. So we have one last image yet. What the heck is going on in this picture? This one's up to you guys. So we're going to put this radiograph up here. If you could tell us what's happening in this radiograph, what's this little white thing hanging out? Throw your answers in the chat. We're going to award the fastest answer a pair of free Apple AirPods at the end of uh, Grand Rounds tonight. It's a pretty good, pretty good deal. Just figure out one image. It's um, a finger alien. Yeah, finger alien. That was also my <laughs> guess. Yeah, it's a mini finger coming out of the other finger. <laughs> So uh, also feel free to ask any questions in the chat. We'll be continuing to monitor it and introduce your questions throughout the rest of the broadcast. But now, without further ado, on to our next segment. This is an ingrown toenail, and attached to it is a patient who is suffering from the pain of an ingrown toenail. So we're going to help her out, and we're going to remove it. Now, you can remove the whole toenail, but we're just going to cut out part of it, just the side that's driving her nuts. First, we're going to get excellent, perfect anesthesia so she can't feel a thing and clean up the skin with an alcohol swab so that we can inject some bupivacaine. Starting on this medial surface, we're injecting deep, and we're going to basically follow this H pattern to create a digital block of her toe. So you inject as you withdraw, and then you can go through that wheel of anesthesia and travel across the toe to the lateral side of the great toe. It's not an inferior toe, it's quite great. And inject as you withdraw, and then you can go along that lateral surface and go deep, and again, inject as you withdraw. And this should give you anesthesia of the entire toe. She should not feel this or that would be terrible. Now we're cutting linearly from the tip of the toenail all the way down to the cuticle and we're taking out about a quarter of her nail just on that side that's causing her so much pain. Once you get it cut and trimmed all the way, you can put on a tourniquet. 
We just cut out a piece of a glove from the finger and roll that up on the toe, and that makes for a pretty good tourniquet. Clamp down on the cut piece of the toenail and turn it towards the intact piece. And as you do, you'll see the spicule pop out, and there it is, the toenail spicule. That was causing her all the pain and suffering. An additional step some providers take at this point is to ablate the nail matrix with something like silver nitrate to try to prevent the ingrown from recurring. So we're pretty much done. Tourniquets off, a little bit of antibacterial ointment on the toe, a two by two, a fancy elastic dressing on the toe, and uh, here's our beautiful work. I'm Dr. Jess Mason, procedure performed by Dr. Scott Reicheldurfer. So thanks to Jess Mason, she's got hundreds of these procedure videos that are on the site. Uh, this is another one of my favorites because I love to take these off. One thing I do, and we'll get uh, the uh, faculty over here to tell us what they do, but the one thing I always tell the patients is that I think I should kill your nail bed so this doesn't grow back because there's a good chance it's going to grow back in the same place. So I take silver nitrate and I jam it into that nail matrix right at the floor there and just kill it so it doesn't grow back. So. Britt, you love to do these. I love what do toes. you love about these and how do you do it differently? I love toes. Um, I think my uh, approach is actually pretty similar. That tourniquet around the toe is really, really helpful. Well, first, a good block is absolutely necessary because this is horribly painful uh, without that. And then the tourniquet, because this gets really bloody very quickly. Um, you know, I've heard people teach that you need to take off the whole toenail. I don't think that's ever necessary unless I guess you have it bilaterally and it's just really infected, but I don't think I ever, ever do that. Um, really, you just got to get deeper than you think you do and get truly into where that nail bed is to remove the whole thing. Because if you don't remove the part that, that's completely overgrown and ingrown down below in the nail bed, this is just going to recur again. Um, the bloodless feel, I think, is the biggest trick. And soak the toe before. That can make it a lot easier to remove the nail. Yeah, I've never done the silver nitrate never torture therapy you're doing mm -hmm. over there, Mel. But <laughs> You don't know what you're doing, kids. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. uh, but for me, I, I hate doing these. But the most satisfying Love. part of the procedure is taking the Kelly and flipping it out. Love you know, um, I really think that also at least has helped me make the decision how much I'm yeah. going to take off. Sometimes doing that first when they're under a really good block mm -hmm. um, gives you an idea how much to cut. Um, Sometimes I don't even think it's half the toenail. It's really like that third of the toenail yeah. that's ingrown. Um, I do have a question for you guys because this has always been plus or minus for me and I've tried it, but I don't know how successful it's been. Do you put anything into the nail bed to help keep it open? Sometimes the teaching is if you take part of the, like the edge of the suture kit and just cut a piece of that um, suture material, putting that into the nail bed and then sewing that in. Maybe that's supposed to help the nail grow back a little bit better. I've tried it. They just fall out. I don't know. Does it work? Mike, what do you think? I think that I have not done that before, and I find it very hard to imagine that it's going to actually really stay in there, just like that, that falling out you're talking about. Um, but my actually uh, teaching point is just a little bit almost on the opposite side of things is the subungual hematoma. And just the very brief point is that that used to be thought that, you know, if it was more than maybe 50% that we would take that toenail off. And honestly, I have to say, not only from the literature, but also personal experience uh, from the um, skier who forgets to cut the toenails before going down a run. I've had several of these. One was trephinated with a hot paper clip, was not very fun. But when you use a little pottery, you do that trephination, the blood comes out, fantastic results, almost instant pain relief. So I know it's a little bit different than the toe removal discussion, but just if anybody wants a little bit easier, faster approach when there is a big subungual hematoma, is to do that trephination with the silver or with the cautery, electric cautery. It works fantastically. Well, um, Gita's got some stuff to say about this too. What, how do you do this, Gita? One other thing I, I guess I might add is that I've had a few patients who were like, "No way, you're not taking off." any part of my toenail uh, they just came in to know like what is what is wrong with my toe and you say oh that's ingrown like we should probably cut this little piece of your toenail off and they're like no especially if you mentioned to them it might grow back funny because it might um one thing that i had not 
heard of until recently, but uh, I had a patient who told me about it first that her podiatrist told her to try it and her other toenail, which had been ingrown. Um, and then I've talked to a couple of podiatrists since, and they say it's like an okay thing to try. I don't know if there's evidence, but if they won't get the nail off and you, um, and they clearly have an ingrown toenail and it's not infected, you can tell them to try going home and doing 20 minute soaks with soap and water, warm water. And then after that, taking a clean piece of dental floss and then trying to get it under the ingrown edge of the nail and you just kind of leave it there and it helps the nail continue to grow. And you do that, I don't know, a couple of times a day, maybe, or at least every day you got to change it and wash it and all that stuff. But it helps apparently elevate that nail a little bit and help it grow out of that ingrown tract. So when it finally comes out, um, hopefully they won't feel that pain of the ingrown nail anymore and then you have to caution them to when they cut their nails to cut them straight don't cut into the corner because that's how you kind of wind up with this problem in the first place so I, I there's no evidence that i know of for the dental floss trick but it seems like something you could try for somebody who really doesn't want you to do the you know the nail removal and just tell them like that would be the right thing to do if you don't want to do that this is totally a second line thing, but maybe you can try it and you've just got to watch out for signs of infection and, you know, caution them how to come back, when to come back. I've never heard of this and I think it's genius. The dental floss trick underneath it. Fantastic idea. All right, uh, let's, enough of toenails. Let us talk of pharyngitis and steroids. All right, paper clips. So we have one paper to cover here and it is about steroids and pharyngitis. So it is titled, Corticosteroids for the Treatment of Sore Throat, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Trials. So sore throats, really common thing that we see both in the ER, urgent care, any primary care outpatient setting. Now we all know that most, the vast majority of sore throats are from a viral infection. However, Many patients coming with this terrible sore throat are seeking antibiotics, sometimes demanding antibiotics. And to be honest, this probably isn't the hill that all of us are going to die on. And so maybe we give antibiotics a little bit more frequently than we should because we know it's really not gonna do anything except probably just increase the resistance of antibiotics because we're prescribing them when patients probably don't need them. So what else can we do for patients? Well, we can do acetaminophen, we can do NSAIDs, but most of the time patients are already taking that and they're still having a lot of pain. Another option is steroids. And that's exactly what this paper looks at. Now there's actually a fair amount of evidence prior to this review coming out that shows that steroids are pretty beneficial. So why aren't more of us prescribing steroids for our sore throats? It might be because a lot of these papers previously had looked at pretty sick patients with really severe symptoms. And so many of us might not be using it for some of the more moderate to severe sore throats. So let's jump into this paper. The objective here was to look at any benefits or potential harm of adding corticosteroids in addition to standard care for sore throats. Now standard of care, the standard care for sore throats, very variable, not standard at all here. Uh, you look at all these different pa papers, some patients get antibiotics, some patients don't, some people get NSAIDs, they get acetaminophen, it's quite variable. But what they're using here is steroids as the intervention. So the design says it in the name, it's a systematic review of randomized trials. And let's talk about the selection here. So there's in this review, there are 10 papers included. Of those 10 papers, it's a total of 1,426 patients. So it's a pretty big study. Now the patients are at least five years of age or older, and they presented either to the emergency room or an outpatient primary care setting, including urgent cares. Again, the intervention was getting steroids. It was quite variable amongst the papers, how much, what type, but the vast majority of these papers, the patients received dexamethasone. And in most cases, adults got 10 milligrams and kids got a weight-based, your 0.6 mg per kg or a max of 10 for children. 
All right, so these patients were presenting to the ER or urgent care setting with uh, either acute tonsillitis, pharyngitis, or really just any complaint of sore throat. So what did they find? Well, they found that patients who received a single dose of steroids were twice as likely to experience complete resolution of symptoms. They also found that patients treated with steroids were 50% more likely to report complete resolution of symptoms in 48 hours. They found that patients who received steroids had complete resolution of symptoms 11 hours earlier than the placebo patients, and they started having pain relief by about 4.8 hours earlier than those who received placebo. So as you can see, the effects of steroids here seemed quite positive. It looked like steroids helped reduce symptoms, mostly pain, and got people feeling better a little bit faster. Now, one of the things we always worry about when we use any intervention is what about adverse side effects? So not all of the 10 papers commented or recorded adverse side effects. A few of them did, and basically they found that the frequency of any side effect was the same between the intervention group and the placebo group. The adverse side effects were pretty rare. One of the big ones that I think most of us would think about with a bad sore throat is the development of a peritonsillar abscess. Only one paper mentioned anything about peritonsillar abscesses, and that really showed, again, these occurred very rarely, but they occurred at the same frequency between both the intervention and the placebo group. The one thing that I didn't mention is how they gave the steroids. Most gave the steroids orally. Three studies, however, gave it as an IM injection. Now, this was a subgroup analysis, but they did find a significant difference in the uh, time of onset, the effect. The IM injection of dexamethasone seemed to work a little bit faster than the PO medication. So my big takeaways here, actually, is it doesn't really change my clinical practice because I've already been using steroids for my sore throats, but I typically use it for my more severe sore throats. And that's because, you know, if they're having symptoms so severe that they're having decreased PO intake, it's hard to eat, it's hard to drink, they're taking the Motrin, they're doing Tylenol, they're doing all the things, that's when I'll add in the steroids. To be honest, I usually don't add steroids for my more mild sore throats. If somebody has runny nose, cough, myalgias, and a scratchy throat, I'm not adding dexamethasone in that case. And I think, you know, although side effects are very rare, I feel like any medication doesn't come without some side effects. And even that's just insomnia from taking steroids. That can be pretty bothersome, especially when you're feeling like crap already from having a URI. So I do use steroids. I think they're helpful. I think they're cheap and relatively safe, but I'm not quite using them for my very mild sore throats. All right, I'm really excited to hear what the other faculty have to say. Mel, thoughts? Uh, why don't we talk to a real Dr. Gita? So Mel, I, I do use steroids for pharyngitis. I really do reserve it for cases where the pharyngitis is, is bad. Is, you know, it's, it's really significant, talking like kissing tonsils or the patient hasn't been able to take POs well. Um, because I think there is evidence to suggest that it really can help with the edema and really hastening some of that reduction of inflammation so the patient can get back to taking POs. And some, that might be the difference between uh, that patient being able to stay home and or having to be hospitalized for dehydration. So I, I think in the more severe cases, it probably is worth it to try. I do not routinely do it in less impressive cases of pharyngitis um, because steroids, to me, uh, do have downsides. Even a short course has its risks. Um, I personally have induced uh, steroid psychosis um, in a, a patient who wound up running around naked in the streets of D.C. It's a terrible thing. So, I mean, I can laugh about it now, but at the time it was terrible. Um, but these are not without risks. You know, I've unmasked diabetes, all sorts of things that you can do, even with short-term uh, steroid prescriptions. So I, you know, I use it, I use it cautiously, but I do use it. Um, I typically would do dexamethasone. I would do an IM dose of dexamethasone one time. One other thing that I would caution everybody about is that if you are, let's say you put an IV and you had the access to put in an IV, uh, and you were hydrating someone because they hadn't been taking POs well or whatever, if you opt to give the dexamethasone intravenously, which is an option, um, you really just have to watch out for the possibility of this 
side effect of feeling like they're burning. Like they have a sensation of feeling like they're on fire and it tends to typically happen like in the perineal area. So if you give the dexamethasone IV and all of a sudden the patient is saying like, oh my God, my pants or whatever's inside my pants is on fire. Um, it's because you gave them the dexamethasone IV. Um, and so you really, I think the way to mitigate that is to give it very slowly. Um, and of course an IM shot, I, I don't, I've never seen it with IM dexamethasone, but that's just, that is just one thing that I would keep in mind. Gita, I think that is actually absolutely hilarious because maybe I'm doing this all wrong, but usually I end up giving it IV because these are the patients who I think are a little bit dehydrated. I want to give them some Toradol. I want to give them a liter of fluid, and then I give them some IV dex. And I haven't actually had anybody complain that their perianal area is burning, but maybe they're just not telling me. So this is good to know. Um, okay, Mel, so what's up next? We are going to do some cases. Let's do it. Let's do some cases. Let's roll into it. So let's do a quick case, and these can be long and boring, and we're going to do this uh, pretty quickly because we just want to make a few uh, important teaching points. So here's the case. It's a 30-year-old male who presents with cough and a little bit of fever and mild shortness of breath. He's got no past medical history. There's no tricks here. This is very simple. Blood pressure looks pretty good. His pulse is pretty good. His respiratory rate's pretty good. His temperature's a little bit up. His pulse ox is fine. A little bit uncomfortable. No significant respiratory distress. He's got some scattered crackles. Rest of his exam is unremarkable. Um, so what's your differential diagnosis for this? Now, this is a picture of Larry Barraf, who uh, a lot of uh, people from UCLA know. Larry used to get really angry when we did grand rounds and we put up differential diagnoses and it's like, that's the stupidest thing ever because that's a whole bunch of wrong diagnoses and one right diagnosis and then we'll get it wrong. <laughs> okay, but uh, Mike has a different opinion. He thinks that if it's not in the differential, it won't be in the diagnosis. So what do you think of this? I'm thinking like this could be just a URI, it could be a little bronchitis, could be a little asthma, could be pneumonia. Could be good. Have you got anything to add to that? Subtract from that? Rona. COVID. Oh, never heard of I it. I mean, this whole thing that we've been doing for a whole couple years now. Okay. Maybe S it's COVID. Scott, got anything else? Or do you want to emphasize anything? Nothing crazy to add, but I would say, you know, like whenever you have hard physical exam findings, you said you had some auscultatory findings. Like at that point, you know, you know that there's something going on in the lungs. And so I'm really limiting my differential there to think about what could actually be causing the sounds I'm hearing. Mike, you're the differential guy. Got anything to add? I always think of cough and, so we think of some of the more unusual things, so cough and weight loss, I think of something like TB or maybe HIV AIDS from pneumocystis. If I think of cough and fever, that doesn't really help differentiate viral versus bacterial, certainly COVID as we talked about. But I like those other considerations for a longer period of time of cough, the things like post-nasal drip, asthma, gastroesophageal reflux disease, you know, over three or four weeks of cough, and then the other thing, just really think about medication type of coughs, for example, from ACE inhibitors. Okay, that's good. So let me give you some more history. He's a software engineer, heterosexual, he's unmarried, single partner. His exposures, this is an important thing I think to ask about. Like, what do you do for fun? What do you do for work? Has you, have you done anything weird lately? So this gentleman actually turned out that he'd been helping his grandmother a week or two before. And she, he was like, she's got parrots everywhere, just like full of birds, mostly parrots. So that got us thinking, so here are some tests that we did. Did a COVID test that was negative, got a chest X-ray, showed some infiltrates down on that left side. CBC wasn't very useful as always, it so showed a little left sit shift. And uh, don't laugh, <laughs> it was just a mistake. And the electrolytes were normal. So are there any other tests you want? Is this over testing? Depending on where you work, particularly in urgent cares, you might have pretty much nothing or everything. That's what's difficult about urgent care. You could have an MRI machine or not even a chest X-ray. So what would you think is the minimal stuff that you want to do? So I'll start with Mike. Yeah, so if all of those tests are negative without the history of the parrots, I would think yeah, this is a pretty reasonable guy to either just observe with symptomatic treatment or I guess theoretically you could, I mean, he did have a big infiltrate there. So certainly treating empirically with some antibiotics. One little trick, and we talk about this a lot, is to mimic the inpatient course by giving some sort of advanced line cephalosporin, like for example, cefuroxime, second generation cephalosporin, plus azithromycin. So you're sort of mimicking inpatient treatment as an outpatient if their oxygen saturation is okay. But the thing that you still, uh, that we still have hanging out there that makes me concerned is this whole parrot thing. I have to say, honestly, 
I'm not a parrot expert, and I'm going to need to go to Corpendium to get me some additional information on what could be going on with this keeper of birds. Wow, look at you. All right, Scott, <laughs> what, what test do you want to do in this? Basically, we were describing somebody who's basically young and healthy. They've sure. got some lower respiratory tract thing going on. They've got the parrots. Do you want to do anything different? Yeah, I'll be honest. Maybe I'm, I'm not as uh, great of a clinician as the rest because on this first visit, I'm not asking this guy about parrots. You know, that's not oh, like, that's not going to be my, my go-to. He yeah. told me about the yeah. parrots. Yeah, I mean, if he comes he in. He really wants to talk about his grandma. Yeah, house. he's got like a, yeah, a parrot on his shoulder doing like a pirate <laughs> impression. Tattoo. Yeah, I'll start thinking of some of these things. Um, no, but I mean, chest x-ray at the minimum, if you're hearing these adventitious lung sounds, definitely, you know, ultrasound a little bit more sensitive if you're like a, a big ultrasound enthusiast and if you have one available to you um, that might be helpful especially earlier in the clinical course of a pneumonia you might be able to pick up some other findings there um, but for me a young otherwise healthy guy i'm probably not doing a whole lot more workup if they look great um, but if they're a little bit older and we're entertaining an acute pneumonia um, getting electrolytes for something if you're thinking about like the curb 65 score of trying to see if they're uremic or there's something else that's going on i think is very very reasonable as well um, but the question I would honestly ask this person about their exposures to or like where are they living, um, what kind of people they're around, are they traveled anywhere, those kind of things also assess for weird things like TB or what else they might have been exposed to. Uh, I don't normally get into pets, but work environment is something that might also come up. All right, Britt, any tests you want to do? I don't have any tests that I would add. I honestly probably would have stopped at the chest x-ray and the COVID test. Um, if he was giving me something like some weird Legionella, I was in an AC shared room thing and I thought maybe they had Legionella and I want to look for their sodium, but he's not giving me like altered mental status or weird seizure activity. I mean, his vital signs, if I remember correctly, were completely fine. Was he mm -hmm. even febrile? He was febrile. Okay, he's bit. febrile, but he's not hypoxic. Nope. He's not tachypnic. Nope. He doesn't have any signs of increased work of breathing. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of would have just stopped with the chest x-ray. Uh, you could have even argued if you heard of like crackles on one side and it seemed focal, you could have argued whether or not you needed the chest x-ray in the first place. That is a good point because the question is, um, in my mind it used to be, maybe it's changed a bit now, Pneumonia or not pneumonia? Not pneumonia, no antibiotics. Pneumonia, antibiotics is the simple way I think about it. So let's ask Gita, how do you diagnose pneumonia? Come on, Gita. I know, a tough question. Um, I would probably say that pneumonia is best defined in the way that we think of it as inflammation in the actual lung parenchyma, like in the alveoli and the air sacs. It's like pus in the alveoli, basically. I'm sure there's, you know, there's radiologic definitions. Um, clinical, you know, clinical presentations that would be consistent with what we all think of as pneumonia. There are probably, you know, pathologists out there that have pathology definitions of pneumonia, but that's the way I think of it, is that there is typically an infection that's involving the alveoli of the lungs. And, you know, clinically, if you can put together, you know, a patient that comes in with a fever, not everyone has a fever, but hopefully a fever, that'll clue you in, respiratory symptoms like a cough, a productive cough is nice. That's always very helpful. Um, it could be dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, other things, but a productive cough is nice. Uh, and then if you find focal lung findings on exam, like crackles on the exam, that to me is enough to clinically say that this is a pneumonia. Um, then you wouldn't necessarily need an x-ray. But then on the x-ray, there are other things that would classify something as pneumonia. But We've all been in that position looking at an x-ray saying like, oh, like, I don't know, is that atelectasis? Is that pneumonia? So um, I, I think for us clinically, thinking of it in those terms is probably the easiest definition. So I used to think uh, pneumonia equals x-ray findings, but really when you look at it, pneumonia is defined in lots of different ways. And what we're, I think, trying to decide is antibiotics versus no antibiotics. So the diagnosis uh, that we gave with this person was pneumonia. And then possible psittacosis pneumonia, which is also known as avian uh, chlamydia. It's got a new name, chlamydidosis, so I can't even pronounce it. Chlamydidosis. <laughs> oh, yes, classic. <laughs> Ornithosis, parrot fever. Now, this is actually different from bird fancy's lung, which is an autoimmune inflammatory condition from inhaling poo all day. This is actually <laughs> from inhaling the bug and getting the pneumonia. Oh, okay. So this is to bring up that there are these atypical pneumonias. Most of the outpatient pneumonia that you see in young, normal, healthy hosts is streptococcus about 70 or 80% of the time. There's a number of atypicals you can see here on the uh, CDC website. But most of the time it doesn't matter because they get better. 
And what do you usually, Scott, what do you usually treat an outpatient pneumonia with? What's your antimicrobial that you would give? Yeah, for a while our antibiotogram was recommending just straight up azithromycin and now it's shifted to either amoxicillin or augmentin as a, as a starting line. And I've also been known to sprinkle a little doxy on the weird stuff every once in a while, covers right. what you need. So um, there's a famous quote by Billy Mallon uh, that was from somebody else and I can't remember who it was originally, but nobody should die without a course of doxycycline. <laughs> and uh, this is not that case, but when you've tried everything else, just try doxy. So yeah. if you do uh, have some exposure, or like it's 1976 and you're at the Legionnaires convention and everybody's <laughs> getting sick, there's a good chance it's probably Legionnaires disease. Uh, if you've got somebody with lots of parrots, then this is a possibility. So doxycycline is just as effective as amoxicillin, but the CDC on their website also note that um, in patients, in studies where there've been thousands of patients treated for outpatient pneumonia, where almost certainly there was a bunch of those people who had atypical pneumonia, they could see no difference between amoxicillin and doxycycline, which tells me that most of these atypicals are going to clear by themselves. And that's probably true of all pneumonia. So Mike, do you have anything different that you treat these patients with? Are you a ZPAC guy? That's sort of out of favor right now. No, I'm not actually. And I wanted to point out that that dose of amoxicillin is a lot higher than most of us would be probably doing 875 twice a day. So bumping that up to three times a day with that thought of the pneumococcal pneumonia is really important to do. And actually in kids also the same way, amoxicillin is incredibly effective. It's like we think of this first line sort of like older antibiotic is really, really effective with that. But that point that Brian Hayes actually I plagiarized him from him a little bit brought out is, is uh, not to be like a broken record, but mimicking that inpatient course as an outpatient by combining something like a cephalosporin with a macrolide or just doxycycline by itself. And both of those would be the first go-to types of treatments that I would use for community acquired pneumonia. Britt, you have another comment? Yeah, I was gonna say, amox so just for community acquired pneumonia, my go-to is amoxicillin. If the patient is older or has more comorbidities, I'll up that to Augmentin. Um, I think it's really important to say that this Z-Pack, this azithromycin that we're talking about adding, is specifically because you're getting a little bit of a weird history for, from him, and shouldn't just be your knee-jerk reaction like, oh, pneumonia-ish symptoms, Z-Pack, because that is causing a lot of antibiotic resistance as well, and a lot of these Z-Packs aren't doing much, if nothing, or just negative effects. So this isn't the like Z-Pack knee-jerk reaction, this is the Z-Pack because you have pneumonia and a little bit of a weird story. Um, probably because of Billy's teaching, I actually cannot remember how many times he's told me nobody dies without a course of doxy. I've heard that so many times. Doxy, um, I think, would be a great choice for this person. It's also what I usually consider when somebody's like, hey, I was sick last week, I thought it was just a virus, had a fever cough, went away, and now I'm feeling worse again. And then I start to worry about there being a staph pneumonia on there. So I always get um, doxy as my medication of choice for those particular patients. Excellent points. The one thing I would just say about doxy, which I think is a great drug for outpatient pneumonia, is that it has significant side effects that you need to tell the patients about or they'll screw this up. And the first one is make sure you drink a lot of fluid after you swallow the 100 milligrams of doxycycline. If it gets stuck in your esophagus, I can tell you from personal experience, pill esophagitis is terrible. It produces a lot of pain and inflammation. I even had to get scoped for it because I'm like, I've got cancer, I'm dying. And then I saw the doctor and they're like, no, no, you should just drink fluids after you take your doxy. The next thing is the hypersensitivity. There's a lot of drugs that produce sunlight sensitivity. Doxycycline is terrible. So if you're a pasty Irishman like me and you're on doxycycline, you can get burned outside in three or four minutes of direct sunlight in the middle of the day. So make sure that they are putting on the hat and putting on the sunscreen because it's bad. So pill esophagitis and that light sensitivity is key. I think you guys did great. Don't make fun of the fact that you should ask people about whether they've got parrots or not. Okay? <laughs> This is very, very important. Not my first question. Yeah, I think, I think we just have to temper our expectations here on the first visit. And I think it's also reasonable, the bounce back pneumonia that's not responding to typical cap coverage, that's when I really start getting into some of those questions and thinking about weird stuff. And just before we all hop off the you know macrolide train, I also want to point out, we're talking about a 30 year old guy who's otherwise healthy. And the COPD person with the increased feeding production, there is like an independent you know anti-inflammatory effect that actually has like a pretty significant number needed to treat to reduce hospitalization in those patients. And so adding that antibiotic on board has an other effect unrelated to the fact that you're using it as an antibiotic to treat a bacterial infection, um, which is helpful. One of the other thing, big things that comes up is treating cough. Now coming up on the UC Max podcast, Gita is, does a whole thing about all of those therapies for cough and which ones work with Brian Hayes. So that will be coming up. 
And when do we go live with this uh, UC Maximus thing, Mike? We go live on October 1st. It's so exciting. We actually have our first two months recorded. So October and November are in the bank. And we have some really, really cool segments on UC Max. So this is applicable not just for folks that work exclusively in urgent cares, but emergency medicine, fast track emergency medicine, all of those. We're really trying to sort of bump up our game with this podcast. Yeah, that's great. It's going to be really good. It's actually not going to come live on the first. I haven't told you yet. It's actually going to be the third because the first is a Saturday and you never go live with a new technology on a Saturday. You wait till Monday. So it'll be <laughs> October 3rd. But on uh, September 29th, Britt, you're putting on a live event again, a virtual series with the UC people? Yeah, with this crew. We're doing the uh, Urgent Care Conference. So this will be hot topics in urgent care, and we're really excited about it. We've got a good team, and it's going to be a fun live event one day. Excellent. There was a question about steroids that people were asking. What was that question? Uh, people were just asking again for the dose mm. of dexamethasone, which would be 10 milligrams yeah. in an adult. And again, each study was a little bit different. One study did 5 milligrams one day and 5 milligrams a second day. Um, but my practice and the majority of the studies were 10 milligrams once. Um, that was for adults. And then 0 0.6 mg per kg as a weight-based dose for kids. Um, as an aside, I don't know why this is true, but the IV formula tastes better than the actual oral formula. So if you're at a place where you have the IV formula of DEX, you can give that oral to kids and it tastes better. And good. I just want to jump in here for a sec with the route, because I see so much IM dexamethasone. You're talking about a medication that's been working for quite a while. There's no, I don't think, great reason to give an IM in a patient who can take oral medications. Would you agree? Or I know the study looked at different populations and different ways to give it, but what are you guys' thoughts on route of administration for steroids? I totally agree with that. It's also your PO challenge. You got them to drink something while they're in the emergency department <laughs> exactly. or the urgent care, wrap it up. Uh, I know, I think Gita mentioned this a little bit too, but for your diabetics, especially your brittle diabetics, like just giving them good discharge instructions to watch their sugars at home when they're monitoring. Um, I've seen a few cases of like bounce back DKA or borderline DKA in patients that just got a one-time dose. It's not super common, but it's it's something to just keep, keep an eye out for. Yeah, and you're not giving a high dose by any means. This is a pretty like standard lowish dose of steroids. So I think with one time, again, it's pretty cheap, it's pretty safe. Um, and in the studies that we looked at in this paper, which were 10, there were no major side effects at all. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, so now you have to tell us what uh, this thing, this alien thing was so that we can give uh, some prizes away. Yeah, so this is a patient you can see at the top of the radiograph that there is a deficit of the soft tissue and there seems to be something that is radio opaque on top. So this is what silver nitrite looks like applied to a wound on uh, x-ray. Um, I've had one patient that came in before that was actually for rule out foreign body in their laceration that was puzzling us for like a whole hour. We we're talking over with the radiologist. Um, but that's what it looks like. Uh, it's not very common. We don't often x-ray things that we've given sil silver nitrate to, uh, but a place you can also show up uh, in a patient that maybe you're in a trauma setting or someone who's had a face or head CT and had a nosebleed that silver nitrate was applied. It'll look very bizarre there that you'll have a metallic foreign body um, in their face after something like after a trauma, um, it could set you down a rabbit hole. I still think it's a finger alien. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the right answer. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I've never seen or thought about that. That's pretty amazing. So I got another question for another prize, and that is we just heard that if you give IV dexamethasone too fast, you get a burning in your pants. You get perineal burning. So here's the question. What's the other drug that we give frequently, not so much in the urgent care, but in the emergency department, IV, if you give it too fast, you get severe perianal itching to the point where people just lose their mind. If you can find the answer to that, first person will give you a prize. So this was the UC Maximus Grand Rounds. Uh, UC Maximus coming out October 3rd, not the 1st, and it's gonna have a monthly podcast, and it's gonna have an onboarding series, and it's gonna have this virtual conference, and it's gonna have everything else. We have Core Pendium and all the other stuff that we've got, plus these Grand Rounds. We're also gonna be doing an emergency medicine Grand Rounds next month. These guys are gonna be putting it on. So we're going to probably alternate month to month. We'll do an urgent care one. We'll do an emergency medicine one month to month in the coming months. We're really excited about this. If you're an MRAP subscriber, you're going to get UC Maximus just as part of your subscription. And if you're an urgent care person who wants to experience something totally new in education where it's all you can eat all the time, something that would be worth many thousands of dollars, we're just lumping it into one thing in a textbook, 
that is coming October 3rd. So thank you for taking the time, use. Thank you for coming and hanging out. Thanks to Gita, everybody. It's been wonderful. And we will see you again in about a month. We'll let you know. And actually, if you missed the beginning because of some technical issues, you can go back on YouTube and just rewind it. And otherwise, we'll be sending out um, a link tomorrow to the whole show so that you can watch it on demand. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, team. Talk to you soon. Herbert out.